In my presentation today, I'm going to offer a critical reflection on, uh, on uh, intercultural communication as presented to us through two professional roles or positions, those of um, community interpreter and intercultural mediator. <clears throat> These are the main points I'm going to cover in my presentation. Um, as you know, in a multilingual and multicultural society, we may come across situations where there is direct uh, intercultural communication and those where there is indirect uh, um, communication. Um, within the um, indirect mediated communication, I'm going to focus, as I said uh, before, on two roles that of intercultural mediator and uh, community interpreter. Then I will be um, comparing the qualities, qualifications expected of community interpreters and, and, and uh, cultural mediators, looking at similarities and differences between them. I will be looking at the underlying assumptions uh, in professional and research discourse regarding these two figures, and I will be commenting a bit on what this tells us about uh, intercultural competence as well. Um, the first thing about intercultural communication is that it starts from difference and the desire to communicate. As Arasaratram and Dofel put it, two principal dimensions in intercultural communication are heterogeneity, different cultural, ethnic, and even geographical groups, and the other dimension is transmission, willingness and desire to transmit something to convey a message to communicate. What we need to be aware of is that whenever there is intercultural communication, we can think of different levels of difference between the two parties, between the two groups, and also different um, levels of development in the sense that when, when two people from different cultural groups, from di different ethnic groups communicate, we can't always think of one single stage, one single um, combination of two participants. These two participants might be, for example, here in Australia, we can find a native speaker of English representing the Anglo-Saxon um, culture. We can find someone who is originally from a different ethnic group, but who came to uh, Australia at a very early age, or actually was born here. We can think of someone who migrated recently. So communication between an Australian-born person and a recent migrant will not be exactly the same as communication between um, an Australian mainstream Anglo-Saxon person and another um, and someone from a different ethnic group, but who was born here. Here we're speaking of different levels of difference. We can't always find exactly the same um, amount or level of difference. And we have different levels of development. And by development, I mean uh, different levels of language acquisition, different levels of proficiency, as well as different levels of uh, cultural competence. Um, the dimension of transmission, of course, in any communicative setting, in any communicative situation, we can find at least certain level of 
communication, a certain level of uh, transmission. But if we look at different uh, communicative acts, we will find, we will definitely find um, a lot of differences. One, for example, whether the communication takes place verbally or non-verbally. Even um, absolute strangers who don't share the common language can sit next to each other and can communicate somehow using uh, gestures or something like that. But this doesn't mean that the communication is verbalized or that the communication is effective in the sense that it can reach um, abstract objective, uh, objectives or professional objectives or something like that. The same for the way communication is conducted. It can be direct, let's say, the two people communicating directly with them the, inter the intervention of anybody else, and it can be mediated or indirect, and that's when the two parties resort to the services of a third party, which in our case is going to be either the community interpreter or um, cultural mediator. Um, I'm going to start with uh, definitions and characteristics and expectations of one professional figure and move on to speak about the other in order to uh, compare them. Uh, the standard de uh, definition of community interpreting is that of a service that enables people who are not fluent speakers of the official languages of the country to communicate with the providers of public services so as to facilitate full and equal access to legal, health, education, government, and social services. We'll come back to this definition when we give a definition to for um, uh, intercultural communicate. Uh, sorry, um, intercultural mediator. My colleagues here in interpreting and translation would know that the qualities and qualifications expected of a community interpreter, interpreter include mastery of the two working language, languages, mastery of interpreting skills, um, general knowledge, uh, specific knowledge in the specific field uh, we're dealing with, etc., uh, etc. Et and then um, among the professional uh, standards expected of interpreters in general and community interpreters in particular are the following. Uh, accuracy, that they need to render messages accurately, exactly as they were produced, exactly as they were intended by the primary uh, speaker. Impartiality, that they need to adopt a professional neutral stance between one party and another, not advocating for any one, of them, uh, any one of them, not taking the side of any one of them. Clarity uh, of role boundaries, and this is very important for the comparison we're going to draw between this professional fig figure and uh, intercultural mediator. This means that an interpreter is employed to interpret to render, to understand and render other people's messages and full stop. They are not supposed to do anything else that uh, falls outside this um, duty. Now, the question arises, since we are talking about uh, intercultural communication and the difference between uh, community interpreting and uh, intercultural mediation, the, the question arises regarding the relation between interpreting or the profession of interpreter and uh, culture. Obviously, whenever we talk about translation and interpreting, culture is always there. You can't translate text, you can't interpret discourse without cultural knowledge, without a cultural background that allows you to understand messages and also to convey them in a, in, in a culturally appropriate manner. 
So interpreters are expected to demonstrate cultural knowledge, which is necessary to understand and render messages. Interpreters, as I said before, are employed to interpret, not to do anything else, and one of such things is to be a cultural uh, expert. In the literature about community interpreting, as well as in guidelines that interpreters are provided with when they start working, there's often this kind of advice that interpreters should not be used as cultural experts. One reason is that they may be experts in their close culture, but not necessarily in all the cultures of all the people who speak their working language. Another is that they may have uh, cultural knowledge, but this doesn't mean that they can interpret every single um, utterance, every single behavior, every single cultural difference based on their own interpretation or their own uh, knowledge of the culture or cultures. Having said that, interpreting is recognized as an act of mediation in the literature, but not comparable to uh, what we refer to as intercultural mediation. What is meant by uh, mediation in interpreting is a type of intervention or role or figure that stands between two parties. Physically, in a typical community interpreting setting, you would have a professional, a client, and an interpreter in between. This position is itself a kind of mediation. In addition to this, um, there are voices in the literature, especially after Wadenshaw's seminal work on uh, interpreting as interaction, that uh, supports the view that interpreting doesn't consist of rendering messages only, doesn't consist of processing texts or talk as text only, but also of coordinating coordinating two participants in an interaction or more. So coordination here is a type of mediation. Then we come to Perchhacker's position in his 2008 uh, book chapter on interpreting as mediation, where he says, the act of mediating in interpreting always involves a cognitive aspect, a cultural linguistic aspect, and a contractual aspect. And mediation is therefore set in the overlapping contexts of conceptual, intercultural, as well as social relations. This illustrates perfectly <coughs> the uh, point Perchhacker makes. An interpreter, especially a uh, community interpreter, would always be involved in these types of mediation. First, cognitive, because any message, whether written or spoken, that is uh, understood, processed, and rendered, would go through the mind of the interpreter. And that's a type of mediation. Cultural linguistic, again, every message needs to be understood within the language it was produced in, within the culture it was produced in, and also rendered appropriately taking into consideration the conventions, the linguistic and cultural conventions of the target uh, audience. Contractual, which refers to social relations, as we said before, when the interpreter positions himself or herself between uh, two parties, they are coordinating a social relationship. For example, the relationship between a professional who has certain uh, power and a client who is powerless. Now, uh, let's look at a definition for intercultural mediator. Um, as I said before, um, I wanted to come back to the definition we provided for community interpreting so that you can draw 
um, a comparison between the two. And you will notice the similarities. Raga Jimeno, who is one of the uh, proponents of intercultural mediation in Spain, says that the uh, intercultural mediator's raison d'etre is to contribute to improving the communication of foreigners, especially migrants from developing countries, with the local community in general and with public service professionals in particular. This, is, this sounds quite similar to the definition we provided for community interpreting, which raises the issue of overlap, overlapping roles between the two. Uh, what I would also like to highlight is the kind of discourse used even by professionals and researchers in the two fields. <coughs> I've highlighted the communication of foreigners. First of all, when we say communication, we normally say communication between X and Y. Here we have the communication of foreigners with the local community as if the local community didn't need to, communi uh, to communicate, as if public service professionals didn't need the mediation of uh, a mediator. The same applies to the community interpreting definition. Community interpreting enables people who are not fluent speakers of, English, uh, of uh, the official languages, as if a community interpreting only facilitated communication between the party that does not uh, speak the mainstream language. And we know that communication applies to both and communication needs and therefore the services of mediators and community interpreters apply to both. Um, we've said that for community interpreters the expectation is that they are uh, uh, professionals who act impartially, don't take sides, and uh, render messages accurately, taking into consideration the um, cultural and linguistic knowledge they have. Now, let's compare it with, uh, compare this with the role and skills of mediators. Again, the same author um, says that the role of intercultural mediator includes the following, interpreting and translation, which is uh, striking, uh, explicitation and negotiation. Explic uh, by um, explicitation, he means um, explicit explanation of administrative procedures, for example, of cultural differences, of any issues that might arise interculturally between the um, professional and the client, and negotiation, the process through which conflicts can be resolved. Obviously, this is quite different from interpreting, from community interpreting. The only point in common, perhaps, is the actual interpreting and translation, especially if it's side translation. Skills expected of an intercultural mediator, linguistic, uh, that's, uh, that means knowledge of the two languages, uh, specific knowledge about terminology, about different registers and ability to use different uh, registers, registers according to the context. That's where uh, mediate, uh, mediation, intercultural mediation according to Raya Jimeno coincides or overlaps with uh, community interpreting in particular or interpreting in general. Another uh, skill or qualification is uh, solid training in intercultural communication, then negotiation and conflict resolution techniques. Obviously for interpreters or um, community interpreters in particular, negotiation and conflict resolution are not part of their training, not part of their um, expectations apart from negotiation of meaning, obviously. Uh, the same author offers us these different cultural communicative fields where a mediator can intervene. As you can see uh, in the first box on uh, your left, language or verbal communication, and that's where the role of the mediator as translator or interpreter 
uh, is involved. Then material culture, customs and beliefs, interactional patterns, that's the uh, communicative uh, practices within one culture or another, institutional norms or administrative procedures, institutional uh, organization, etc. And as you can see on your left, um, he has explicit difference and implicit difference. That is to say, the more um, different two cultures are, the more explicit the difference would be. And the less different they are, the more implicit the difference would be. And this means that for the uh, cultural or intercultural um, mediator, there will be different levels of intervention in the sense that in those cases where difference is explicit and doesn't generate uh, issues or problems, he or she doesn't have to intervene. But if difference is implicit, which means that the other party is not aware of it, but it turns out that it becomes problematic in the interaction, then he or she would need to uh, be involved. Another uh, spokesman for intercultural mediator is this time from um, Belgium. And uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that um, here in Australia, for example, we normally speak of community interpreters, interpreters in general. We uh, can hardly hear anyone mentioning the word intercultural mediator. But in some European countries like Italy, Spain and Belgium, it's quite popular and it's competing with interpreting. Um, this representative from Belgium uh, says that um, an intercultural mediator is expected to interpret, once again, overlap, professional overlap with uh, interpreters, act as cultural broker, provide uh, advice, assistance and emotional support, be involved in conflict mediation, uh, act as advocate, advise professionals on issues facing ethnic minority members, provide and provide uh, health education to patients. Perhaps, apart from interpreting, all these uh, roles and duties are exactly the things that we advise future interpreters not to do, because they're not part of their role. The same author, and this is very interesting, uh, when he speaks about the results of his study, the, the, the results of the intercultural mediation project he reports on, he says that um, one of the findings was that patients were ha more happy to, um, uh, more willing to uh, communicate about different things in their lives, about their uh, health, simply because they found themselves in the presence of an intercultural mediator. So the author reports this as a success, that intercultural mediator's presence resulted in better communication. And I would like to come back to this concept of better communication in a second. However, the quality of the interpreting done by the mediators was often poor. And this is not surprising because in uh, these countries, uh, those people who act as intercultural mediators often take courses in intercultural mediation but don't get trained in interpreting and translation, and some of them actually don't speak another language. I was invited as a guest lecturer in Spain, for example, uh, in uh, different universities where intercultural mediation courses were offered. But the students, all of them were Spanish, and they didn't speak um, another language. In some cases, they would speak uh, English, but they were expected to work with Romanians, Arabs, and uh, Africans. Um, I said this is not surprising, because in order for the communication, or intercultural communication in this case, to be effective, well, an essential, an essential component is linguistic 
competence. If it's not there, you can hardly uh, uh, act as a mediator, even if you had empathy or showed solidarity. Apparently, what worked in the first uh, finding was that the mediator's empathy, uh, advocacy, or solidarity encouraged patients to communicate, to talk. But in order for them to be um, effective intercultural mediators and communicative mediators, obviously they needed to be trained in interpreting techniques and in the relevant language. Almost time? Okay, I'm, uh, I'm wrapping, wrapping up, yeah. Um, well, what does this tell us about intercultural competence? What these uh, cultural mediators, in the case of the uh, Belgian uh, project, shows is that uh, cultural mediators um, demonstrated a level, a certain level of um, empathy and for intercultural communication or intercultural communication competence, empathy is essential. The point is that empathy is not enough. In the literature, you can find references to empathy, let's say attitude, but also to ability, to skills, the ability to demonstrate, to enact, to act, on the knowledge you have and the uh, positive attitudes you have. If that ability is missing, we can hardly speak of uh, effective communication or mediation. Uh, we have here the findings of a study done by uh, Arasaratnam and Dorfel. Uh, the reason I included this study is that the um, qualities expected of a competent intercultural communicator are not based on the uh, theoretical <coughs> framework of a given author. Rather, they're based on what people from different cultural backgrounds said. The authors conducted a uh, semantic network analysis. And one of the things, one of the findings they came up with was that uh, competent intercultural communicator was expected to be person-centered and to be observant. And I think these two um, qualities are normally found in intercultural mediators. The thing, as I said before, is that these qualities alone would not help in effective communication or effective uh, mediation. Now, regarding, uh, again, the two roles of community interpreter and uh, cultural mediator, we've seen the overlap between the two. We've uh, seen the misconception that mediators can actually interpret and translate, and translate even if they haven't received uh, adequate training. So what's um, the position we can take regarding this overlap? and? Uh, whether we can, whether we would like the two professions to be um, separated, to be quite distinct, to be differentiated one from the other, or whether we can use them as com complementary services for the benefit of those who need them. Uh, Perch Hacker's position here is that the two can be expected to coexist most likely in a constructive complementary relationship and even in the same person provided that the duly qualified professional and his or her clients are aware that the service provided in a given interaction is either interpreting or mediation. What I find troubling in this position is uh, what I highlighted there even in the same person. Let's say the possibility of the same uh, person acting as interpreter sometimes and as uh, intercultural mediator others. I find it 
uh, problematic because in community interpreting there's already too much controversy, too much debate, too much confusion about the role of a uh, community interpreter. And as we have seen, there's already confusion and overlap between the uh, two uh, professional figures. So this kind of position can only, I understand um, uh, where uh, Coach Hacker comes from, but uh, this kind of position can only uh, perpetuate the confusion and overlap. Instead, what I propose is juntos pero no revueltos. That's Spanish, which uh, means more or less together but not mixed. Which means, in my view, uh, community interpreting and uh, cultural mediation should join forces in order to serve the public that needs uh, this kind of uh, mediation, whether linguistic or uh, cultural, but they need to be clearly uh, distinct professions. Okay? Um, community interpreting, uh, implicit cultural mediation. I'm using here um, two of the models I've uh, mentioned, uh, Raga Jimeno and uh, Puchaka, in order to uh, come up with an alternative uh, position whereby community interpreters can um, mediate culturally, but this doesn't mean that they will resolve issues, resolve problems, or speak about cultural differences overtly. Simply, they would still render messages, they would still interpret messages through um, their pragmatic understanding of these messages and their uh, knowledge about the culture and language they are translating from and into. Intercultural mediators would do something quite different. They would explicitly mediate. That's what um, uh, can be referred to as contractual mediation, whereby intercultural mediators would be uh, employed to overtly, to explicitly mediate between two parties to negotiate uh, if there is a conflict or whatever. Community interpreters uh, may explicitly refer to cultural issues. That's simply because cultural issues will arise while they are interpreting, but the way they discuss cultural issues would, quite, would be quite different from the way uh, interpret, uh, sorry, in, uh, the cultural mediators do. Uh, in the sense that they would only speak about cultural uh, issues or cultural meanings when there is a misunderstanding. In order to attend to or clarify a misunderstanding, they would refer to um, these cultural issues. And finally, intercultural mediators may represent but not act as interpreters. By representing here, I mean uh, during the negotiation process or the conflict resolution process, they may be called upon to uh, interact with both parties, ask questions, etc., in order to find out the, their respective positions. But rather than interpret the messages, they would just summarize the positions and convey them to the others as part of the negotiation process. But that would be clearly distinguishable from interpreter, interpreting. Thank you very much. Thank you.